All right, thanks Ming for the invite and thanks John for the talk before. Um, my name's Nago, I'm a research data management specialist at the National Computational Infrastructure at the ANU in Canberra. And I'm going to be talking today about using NetCDF in Jupyter Notebooks. My background is essentially geophysics, uh, specifically magnetotellurics, and that's from a field that generally doesn't use these uh, high performance data formats. I, I come from a background of using a 40 year old data formats like ASCII or EDI. And so I've just been working at NCI for a year now. So I'm more going to go through how to use NetCVFs, maybe not as much detail as John went into with the HDF5. But yeah, so I'll sort of walk through what NetCVF is, um, some softwares that you can use it in and how to access it in Jupyter Notebooks and the likes. So I'll begin with the introduction to NetCDF. So network, network common data form, it's a data format and a set of libraries to read and write the format. And in many commonly used programming languages, and it's a de facto standard in the climate and marine science communities due to its simplicity of use, robust software and portability. And it supports the creation, access and sharing of array oriented scientific data. Uh, oops, sorry. It was developed and maintained by Unidata, which is part of the UK University Corporation for Atmospheric Researchers, which is like a conglomerate of 120 or so universities in the States. And it's funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, the project started in 1989, uh, version three, which was released in 97 is used widely. Um, version four, which was released in 2008, allows the use of the HDF5 data file format. And version 4.1 adds support for C and Fortran client access, as well as the use of open app services, which I'll go through in a second. Uh, it's platform independent and data are stored in a fashion that uh, allows efficient subsetting. Uh, yeah, just some of the formats over the history, the classic format, the 64-bit offset format, and now currently the NetCDF4 HDF5 format. And so the NetCDF4 project it uses HDF5 as a data storage layer. This allow, and it also allows for parallel I.O. for high-performance computing, has chunking and compression options as well. And it provides both read and write access to all earlier forms of NetCDF. So the structure of a NetCDF file, well, it's made up of three basic components. Variables, so this is where you store the actual data. Dimensions, uh, they give the relevant dimension or access information, things like latitude, longitude, time, uh, depth, and the like. And attributes, so the attributes provide auxiliary information for the variable, so metadata about the variable, what's its name, how is it recorded, and the likes, as well as global data. So what was the reason you collected the data, possibly an abstract about the data set, uh, et cetera. So NetCDF have various conventions associated with them. I'll just go through one of the conventions at the moment uh, today, which we often use at NCI, which is the CF Metadata Convention, or the Climate and Forecast Metadata Convention. And these are guidelines and recommendations as well, uh, as to where to put information within a NetCDF file. And they allow the creator of a data set uh, to include information about the data and the data set in a structured way. And this makes it easier for others to use and retrieve the information. Um, so yeah, some of the properties of NetCDF, they're self-describing. So they include information about the data it contains they're portable, they can be accessed by computers with different ways of storing integers, characters, and floating point numbers, and they're scalable. So you can subset a large data set, and that can be accessed efficiently. Uh, appendable, so uh, data can be appended to a properly structured NetCDF file without having to re recreate the data set or copying it over. Shareable. So one writer and multiple readers can simultaneously access the same NetCDF file. 
And finally, they're archivable. So access to all earlier forms of NetCDF data are supported by current and future versions of the software. So some example applications that use NetCDF. There are a lot of them. I'm just going to go through a couple just to give a general example. So NCO, which is the NetCDF operator suite, uh, it's a Unix command line utility uh, providing a range of commands for manipulating NetCDF files. So you can do things such as concatenation, array slicing and averaging fairly, fairly easily. NCView, which is a visual browser. So to quickly visualize what a NetCDF file looks like, you can use the NCView or another option is Panaply, which is a uh, Another NetCDF file viewer developed by NASA. Um, additionally, you can use Python or uh, MATLAB or R. And for the examples I'll give in a sec, I'll just be using Python. You can read uh, the NetCDF files. There are many more. If you take a look at the Unidata website, they have a lot of different applications that you can uh, use on your NetCDF files. Um, I'll just quickly go through some examples of how to use this. So I'm just going on to the NCI's virtual desktop infrastructure. And so it's essentially it's a desktop. So users have essentially a desktop in the cloud, an eight core computer, and it's backed by uh, 10 plus petabytes of research data. So you can access yeah, all different sites for research data in the cloud. So just some of the examples I just went through, how you can grab what's called the open that link of a specific data set and you can load that in and it will show you without having to download anything, you can look at what's contained in the file and you may be interested in a specific variable. You can see some metadata associated with the variable or some more associated with the whole file. Um, and if you want to visualize it, you can quickly create a plot. And then you can sort of zoom in and see roughly what the data is going to look like, what area it covers, and the like. So you can get a quick visualization of what's contained in the NetCDF file. Additionally, if you just want to quickly visualize the metadata via the command line, you can just use a function called ncdump, and it will dump some of the metadata. So here we're, we're just looking at some, uh, I needed to learn time series data. So here we're looking at the uh, dimensions and the variables and the variables have metadata associated with it, such as the units used, the uh, long name, the sampling rate, dipole lengths and the like. Additionally, there are some global metadata. So you can include a type, title of your survey, summary, so some sort of abstract, um, who recorded the data, the date created, the conventions used, as well as uh, things like, for example, in MT, they have a typically time series process is done with a program called Burp. And so that creates, uh, that takes various inputs. So you can put the exact inputs you use to create your data set and someone else can reproduce using the variables you use. So yeah, it's kind of good for reproducibility having all this metadata. Anyway, I'll get back to the talk. So yeah, this is the NC dump we just went through. So the collections we have at the NCI, like I said, we have 10 plus petabytes of research data so that access utilize uh, by a variety of options. So Direct access on the file system. So if you have access to the Rage and supercomputer, you can just access uh, the data directly. Or using web and uh, data services. So we just talked about the Threads data server. And this allows for browsing and accessing of data as well as metadata. So there are various tools associated with the uh, Threads data server. Opened up, where you can grab a link and plug it into say Python or R and go and work on it. NetCDF subset, it's just a way you can subset the data and potentially use a smaller subset of a larger file. There are some OGC web mapping service and web coverage services I won't go through, it, but I'll just quickly show you what I mean by the Threads data service. So at NCI, I'll just go from the top. And this is a Threads data server and 
we have a whole bunch of data sets from different communities, whether it be weather, geophysics, our satellite data. And in order to access a data set, we can go to say, whatever we're interested in. And we can see here, these sort of files are roughly 2.3 gigabytes. So we don't want to be downloading that. So we want to use some sort of a service on it. I'll just go through a couple. If we want to quickly visualize the data, we can use the Godiva 2 data viewer. And here we have all the different variables contained in the file. And we can click on one. And it will give a quick preview. I mean, you might have to change the scale here, but it can give you, if you pick the right scale, a quick preview of the data. So some other tools we have. Uh, the net CDF subset. Um, so here are all the variables contained in the file. We may only be interested in say, this variable. We may only be interested in a smaller bounding box. So maybe say an area around here, we can find a bounding box that we're interested in. We may only be interested in a specific time range. We can adapt the time range and then make a request. So your two, two gigabyte file might be reduced to say a few megabytes using the subset service. And the OpenDAP service, well, this is just, you can, you can see all the global attributes, the variables, uh, their local attributes. And utilizing this link, you can plug it into say Python as an example, and then extract the data just, just on the fly. There's no need to download it all. I'll go through an example in a second. Back to the talk. So we can also access through data portals. So there's various data portals, for example, the Virtual Geophysics Lab uh, Laboratory or the eReefs Online Analysis, Analysis Portal. There's a few data portals here at the Nectar website. I encourage you to take a look at that. And we can access the data using the virtual labs, which is the virtual desktop I was just in. So I'll just go through some example next to your notebooks. Uh, just a quick one, Jupyter is an open source web application that allows you to create and share documents that contain live code, equations, visualizations, and narrative texts. And it makes data analysis easier to record, understand, and importantly, reproduce. Uh, it has it supports over 40 programming languages, including Python, Julia, and R, and many others. Uh, the examples I have are in Python and we're going to open the files using the data set function. Um, so typically you would uh, import uh, from NetCDF, you'd import the data set function. Uh, this would be your open DAP link, and then you could essentially open the file using the data set function. From there, you can look at the metadata. So what are the dimensions in the file? Uh, what are the variables and the like? So I'll just quickly go through a couple of examples. I prepared earlier. So this is just a geophysics example. So like I said, you just import the NetCDF uh, data set library. You grab your open that link from say the threads data server as an example, open the data set. And then once we've opened the data set, we can browse basic information about the file. So here we're looking at the dimensions and the variables in the file. And once you've looked at what you want, you can start extracting and plotting data. So here we're just extracting some data and plotting a, a global map of Australia. So this is a gravity map of Australia. The great part about this is everything's documented and there was no need to download anything. And there we have it, a gravity map of Australia. And if we want a subset, we can create some criteria for a subsetting and plot that. So here we just have a, a small subset and you can continue to do things like put transect lines and the likes, lots of things you can do. So that's one geophysics example, but it's essentially the same with other, other disciplines. This is one using, uh, what is it? Ocean forecasting data and satellite data. And so once again, we just Grab the open that URL, open it up using the data set command, and we can view 
the metadata and we can extract and plot data. Here are just some examples. We can do the same for a small subset once again. And we can do the same with some satellite data, which we've done here. And we can do a RGB band of the satellite data. And in the end, we can combine the two data sets. So this is just a which is somewhere down the bottom here. Yeah. A manipulation where we combine the ocean forecast data and the satellite data. Just a couple of examples. Um, I'll just get to the conclusions now. Yeah. So the advantages of using NetCDF, well, it's an open format and open source tools. So accessing data is easily done through common libraries. It's self-describing, so you don't need supplementary metadata files. Uh, NetCDF 4 allows storage of n-dimensional data. It can store all size data at once. Um, it can be optimized for HPC data settings. So it offers the chunking and compression of, uh, options. Um, we have the Threads data server, which gives you many tools for accessing the uh, NetCDF files so we can move away from the download era. Uh, has strong usage in many research communities, climate and marine science especially, but there are other communities that are adapting it uh, now. So the earth sciences in particular, like some geophysics communities are starting to adapt NetCDF. Um, it supports parallel rewrite access to NetCDF 4 HDF 5 files. Some disadvantages, well, if you're like me and you uh, have never used it before, there's a steep learning curve involved. So yeah, the documentation takes a lot of time and effort to understand. And users will need to update their toolkit so they have to learn new tools so that they can view contents and visualize the data from NetCDF files. So, uh, here are some links to some websites. Uh, some of the artwork provided was from an ex-CI employee named Jonathan McCabe. If you're interested, here's his Flickr. And that's it. Thank you.